Thanks for being here this morning. I'm glad you're you're here on Mother's Day, and uh, if you're here with your mom. We certainly are glad you've come. If you're here as a mom, and maybe uh, someone's far away or someone's with the Lord, our prayers and thoughts with you. And maybe if you're not a mom, it's a time too. And we're grateful for everybody that's here. And. Uh, I was joking with somebody back in the back. Father's Day sort of goes by the wayside. You know, we just sort of exist. And uh, I guess that's our own fault. But this is a special day. And so we're glad you're here. Thanks for being here. If you're our guest, we're awfully glad you've come our way. And uh, just be aware of our joy. And if you would fill out the visitor's card that's on the back of the board and tear it off and drop the off your plate. If you got a minute for a cup of coffee, I'll be at that door right over there. I'd love to take you back to our new... Now let me tell you about, uh, there's no activities tonight. Next Sunday, next Sunday night, a special opportunity uh, for music with our centennial of the city. The uh, church circle churches are joining together to do a musical presentation at 7 p.m. And it'll be over at First Broad Street. But our musicians will join the folks from the Presbyterians and the Methodists and the Lutherans. Is that right? So put that on your calendar for next Sunday. Wednesday night uh, is a special time. We will have our 4.30 Bible study, but at 6 o'clock we will <laughs> celebrate with all of our RAs and GAs and all the things they've done this year in missions. So be aware of that. Pray with me if you would. Lord, we're grateful that you give us life. We're grateful for the vessels through which you give us life. And we're thankful for our moms, whether they are present with us or far away or present with you. Help us to remember the joys of the gifts that have been given to us and help us to commit to share those joys for future generations. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. i got to tell you, I wish I had a time warp machine for a lot of reasons, but I wish I could take you back to 1985. 1985 was a good year for us. Uh, Tennessee won the Southeastern Conference Championship. <laughs> I think we might have won it once or twice since then, but it's been a while. But in 1985, had you heard my sermon on Mother's Day in 1985, you would have gotten an earful. Because I wasn't yet a parent. I had all the advice in the world in 1985 on how to be a parent. The last day of 1985 was a great day for us as a family because our first child was born, but it was a lousy day for me as a preacher because immediately all of my effectiveness preaching on parenting went out the window. I read about a guy who was an expert on parenting, and before he had children, he wrote a book called 20 Rules for Parents. Get this? 20 Rules for Parents. And then he and his wife had a baby, and he changed the book to 10 Guidelines for Parents. <laughs> and then the child went to school, and he changed it to 5 Suggestions for Parents. <laughs> and then the child became a teenager, and he said no comment. <laughs> and lastly, he became a grandparent, and he wrote 40 Rules for Parents. You see the cycle I'm talking about? So what would happen if we followed a biblical model for parenting? Leland read this scripture earlier. I want you to hear it again. We talk about biblical parenting 101. What does it look like to be a biblical parent? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, Paul writes to this group of Christians in Asia Minor about what it means to be a godly parent. So here's chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. Notice that the first words are directed to the kids. So anytime you want to, you know, hammer down, this is it. But it changes quickly. Children, obey your parents and the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and your mother, which is the first commandment with a promise. So that it may go well with you, and you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers... Do not exasperate your child, your children. Instead, bring them up in the nurture 
and admonition, that's the way I learned it, but the training and instruction of the Lord. I want us to talk this morning about what does the Bible say about being a parent. And I want you to see six ideas with me that I think every one of them emanate from the very pages of the Bible. And the first one is pretty simple. First and foremost, we ought to see our kids as gifts from God. Everything you will ever own, you'll leave behind. But the one thing you'll leave behind that will live beyond you are the kids, if you're blessed to do that. This week I heard about a child that uh, mom and dad were saying, the child didn't quit crying for 18 months. And I don't want to be a topper, but ours didn't quit crying for 24 months. <laughs> there were moments when I wondered if this truly was God's gift to us, or if it was God's testing of us. You ever feel that way? But here's what the scripture says. Kids, Psalm 127 says it this way. Children are your heritage. The only thing you're going to leave behind that's going to make a difference is not your money, it's not your buildings, it's not your stocks, it's your kids. Second thing I'd like you to see with me. One of the rules and the roles God gives us is to teach them his ways. I want us to see two passages of Scripture. They both come out of the Old Testament, out of the teaching to Israel. First of all, Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. I want you to let these words soak in. These commandments I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home. And when you walk along the road, when you lie down, and when you get up. I want you to look at that phrase right there just for a second. Talk about them when you sit at home. I saw a commercial last night that really was powerful because I'm one of these people. <clears throat> I wish I could remember the exact title. But it showed a family eating. And... Mom had her cell phone out. Dad had his iPad out. One boy has his game out. Another one has, the daughter has another device out. And the commercial said something like this. Turn them off at dinner. I wish I could remember the exact thing. Turn them off at dinner. Look at this. What did we do before we had these? Well, we probably looked at the floor, to be perfectly honest. But look at what they did back then. Talk, talk about the Lord's commands when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. We're looking at a new <coughs> curriculum for our children's ministry. And one of the things, one of the advantages it provides is this, that it provides materials for when you're at home at mealtime with your family. It provides materials for study time at bedtime. It does the very thing that the scripture's talking about. I want to tell you, we have a great, great, great Sunday school for our kids. But if that 45 minutes is all they get all week, it's not enough. Third thing I want you to see. We're to bring up the children in those words I used from the King James. In the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Well, if you lived back then, that was all done for you. You sent them to the synagogue. They went to the synagogue for worship. They went to the synagogue for education. That education was both what we would 
consider reading and writing, but it was also scripture. It's a different time now. Our Kingsport City Schools do a phenomenal job. The Sullivan County Schools do a great job. But there are truths they cannot teach. They just can't do it. Try as they want to, they are not able to do it. So, our kids, our kids have the blessing of you teaching them the ways of God. Fourth thing I want you to say. We're most like God when we love Him. Over in the little bitty book of Titus, Titus chapter 2, verse 4. I'd like you to see that text. This is the only passage I know that's directed specifically uh, to moms. They can urge the younger women to love their husbands and children. These are nurturing kind of things. What does it mean to love your kids? I will not ask you how many of you would die for your kids because every one of you would raise your hand. You would give your very life's blood for the kids that you gave life to. The fifth thing I want to talk to you about is incredibly practical. God tells us that we are to show them our faith. We're to tell them about the moments when God has acted <coughs> in our lives. I read a study this week that I read a few years ago. I want you to hear this closely. If you want your kids to grow up worshiping, if you want your kids to grow up connected to a congregation, the greatest predictor, the greatest statistical predictor of your youngsters growing up to be active worshipers and disciples is your participation when you're raising them. Your kids are much more likely, statistically, it's a huge gap. If you're active in worship on a regular basis, if you're a disciple on a regular basis, the odds of your kids continuing that pattern, sometimes after college, stop that. The most, if you want your kids to know what you do, you show them. The sixth thing I want you to see is something that is in our text today. Parents and children are to show mutual respect to each other. I want you to listen to what it says. It doesn't say this to moms, so you moms can do all you want. But listen to what it says in Ephesians chapter four, 6, verse 4. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Now, Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. I told you in 1985, I could really tell you how to be a parent. Since 1985, I can't. Do you ever vacillate? As a parent, do you ever vacillate? Are you ever, this is it, by golly, you're going to do it this way or else? And then five minutes later, you're, go ahead and do whatever you want. Have you ever done that? I wish, listen to what it says. Do not exasperate your kids. Have you ever exasperated your kids? Have you ever made your kids feel like they don't know which way to turn because I'm so, what's the word I'm looking for, inconsistent? Sometimes, you better do it now. Our children did not know there was a number past three <laughs> until they were in fourth grade math. I'm going to count to three. One, two. It's like, well, there's no number past three. I want you to see this. Sometimes we take that first part of Ephesians. Children, obey your parents, for this is the will of God. Right out of the commandments. And we take it as a license to act in a way God wouldn't want us to act. And then I read that part down to verse 4. Don't exasperate your kids. And I wonder if that's not something I've done way too much. 
What I want to say to you is, is this. This business of parenting is the only thing you will do till the day you die. It's the only thing you do until you draw your last breath. And some of you who have kids who are 40 or 50 or 60 will say, yeah, and it doesn't seem like it's any easier than when they were four or five or six. But here's what you do. You are most like God. You are most like God when you love them, when you teach them, and most importantly, when you model faith for them. So how are we doing? Pray with me if you would. <clears throat> Lord, we're grateful that you give us the chance to continue life on this earth from one generation to another. We, to, today our minds are on those who gave us life upon the sacrifices they made for us, upon the hours they gave, the years they gave, but our minds are also on those who follow us. Today, help us to be those who truly live out our faith in front of the generation to come. Make us mindful of your grace and of your mercy. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our invitation is simple. If you'd be a follower of Jesus, if you'd unite with us here at First Baptist, we'd like to make, invite you to make your way to the front and share your news with one of us here. As we stand and sing together, let's stand together.